I'm going to invite you, if, a, if you have a Bible or a device, to turn to Psalm 119. And if you're new to reading the Bible, um, if you open up in the middle, you've got a good chance of hitting the Psalms. And then Psalm 119 is the longest Psalm in the Bible. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. And for the next three weeks, we'll be looking at this Psalm and being shaped by God's Word. Psalm 119 is a commentary of the Bible that's in the Bible. Psalm 118 talks about the value of getting God's Word into you, or the other way of saying this is when God's Word is in you, then you're going to be blessed. Over and over, God says, if you meditate on my Word, if you delight in my word, if you obey my word, here's what's going to happen. And so in the next three weeks, that's kind of our goal, the challenge to get it into us. And uh, living today, we obviously understand uh, we're often busy and rushed and distracted. And sometimes we try to pick up our Bibles and we're just frustrated um, with, I didn't get that much maybe this time. And so we're going to, in this series, we're going to encourage you to engage with Scripture, to have more of a discipline when it comes to Scripture and being shaped by it. And so for three weeks, you'll see part one. Uh, we're going to look at the first seven sections, and then there's two more parts as well. And we're going to look at reasons why you should be in God's Word, why you should get more of it into you. And uh, before we look at the three reasons uh, for getting into God's Word. Uh, today, we're going to, I'd like to just share a few introductory comments. First, you'll notice if you open your Bible to Psalm 119, there are 22 sections. Uh, again, Psalms are a prayer book and a song book, so we can say 22 stanzas. And uh, each of these sections begin with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Okay, we have 26 Letters in our English alphabet, the Hebrew language has 22. So Aleph, Bet, Gimel, and Daleth, that's A, B, C, D. So there's 22 letters in the, in the Hebrew alphabet, 22 sections, and under each section, there are eight verses. And each of the eight verses start with the particular letter of the section. So we don't get that in our English Bibles, but in a Hebrew Bible, you would see Aleph, 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 all eight verses under Aleph, and then same thing under Bet. And the reason that it was laid out this way was to aid in memorization, to help a person memorize or sing this chapter. So you'll find 22 sections corresponding to the Hebrew alphabet. You'll also find a number of terms for Scripture, for God's Word. Uh, it, uh, the psalmist talks about God's laws, His statutes, His ways, His precepts, His decrees, His commands, His words, and His promises, and there's, uh, you can use them, uh, they're synonyms, uh, so they interchange, and you'll find uh, 22 times 8 is 176 verses, and I think there's only about four or five that, uh, verses that don't refer to God's Word, so you're going to see these different terms throughout Scripture where the psalmist is talking about the value of getting God's Word into you. And then finally, one other note, uh, this psalm is not about the truthfulness and authority of the Scripture in the sense that that's the focus. Psalm 119 is about the sufficiency and the beauty of Scripture. So we've talked uh, before about the authority and truthfulness of Scripture. We'll talk about it again uh, here at Woodside. Uh, but for a basic understanding, of the, for those that are new to the Bible, uh, we would hold that the Bible is inspired, inerrant, and infallible. So inspired, if we could get the next slide there. Inspired has the idea that God so directed the people to write down exactly what he wanted written down. Uh, all scripture is God breathed, 2 Timothy 3, 2 Peter 1, um, that men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the word inspired is not uh, simply, you know, hey, I think I'll write something for God. But it's not either where you're in a trance and it's like a mechanical dictation. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. It's not a trance either. God used these different people, their 
uh, cultural background, their literary style, their personality, and move them along so that what came out on the printed page was exactly what he wanted. And it's his word. Secondly, it's inerrant, it's true, it's uh, without contradiction or error in the original manuscripts. And again, we've talked about it in the past, we'll talk about that in the future. Original manuscripts, over time, scripture has been copied, and there's been the odd little tweak, uh, mistake, but it's amazing how God's word has been preserved. Uh, over the years. When you look at something like the Masoretic text and Dead Sea Scrolls and a thousand year period, and, and it's just like word for word, it's amazing. Um, but we would say in the original text, manuscripts, that they're without error and contradiction. And then finally, infallible, that the scriptures are accurate, reliable, and trustworthy for all matters of faith and practice. And it would say we hold to that. All matters of faith, everything we believe comes under the authority of the Word of God. Practice everything we do or how we behave comes under the authority of the Word of God. So truthfulness and, and um, authority of Scripture, we're not looking at that for the next three weeks uh, there. Uh, but I will say uh, uh, that Scripture, like any other book, but we believe this is a special book, uh, it needs to undergo scrutiny. It needs to, you need to look at uh, some of those things and what's going on here. We're looking at the beauty and sufficiency of Scripture. And one last thing, if you're new to the Bible, again, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is a love story. It's one story of a God who made you and me, loved us so much he came into this world in the person of Jesus Christ. He lived, died, and rose again. He died for our sins so that we could have a relationship with him. And this is a story. And what is so fascinating about the Bible is that it has 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. It was written by 40 different authors in three different languages, Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament, Aramaic, a little bit in both, on three different continents, Africa, Asia, and Africa, Asia, and Europe over a 1,500-year period, all sharing and telling one story. Isn't it amazing? 40 authors over 1,500 years, and it's all about God coming to this world to save us, the plan, the story of redemption that is found in Jesus. So, overview of Scripture, uh, it's God's Word, it's inerrant, it's infallible, and inspired, and now we're going to look at the beauty and sufficiency of Scripture, and for you, that you would engage more with it. So why should you? Here's the first reason. It blesses you. Okay, this is generally, the psalmist is going to remind us that when we get into God's word and it gets into us, we're blessed. So Psalm 119, uh, beginning in verse 1, the psalmist writes, blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. The psalmist is saying that if you keep his statutes, you walk according to his law, you are going to be blessed. And the original word blessed in the Hebrew literally means, oh, how happy. It has the idea of, oh, how happy, oh, how content, oh, how satisfied. He's not the person who has a lot of money and stuff. He's not the person who has uh, who is popular and has a lot of followers on Facebook, is the person who gets into God's word and lives according, notice that, according to the law of the Lord. He lives or she lives within the boundaries of his word. The blessed life is a life that is lived within the boundaries of God's word. You see, God has not only revealed to you in his word who he is, and how he wants a relationship with you, he's revealed in, your, in his word how he wants you to live. He wants to bless you. He is for you and not against you. If you want to be a whole person, if you want to be the person God created you to be, you live within God's word. And oh, how blessed. Doesn't mean you're not gonna have difficulties and trials but you will have in your soul a contentment and a satisfaction and a joy and happiness that this world can't give. So that's the path to blessedness that the psalmist says. Today, again, we hear a different or different voices saying, no, that's not the path. I mean, if you want to become a Christian, 
man, you've just given up on joy and happiness. Oh my goodness, I feel sorry for you. What we hear from the world is, no, you need to go on this path. And today, uh, here's the kind of the tagline. It'll change. It's changed all through history, all through different cultures. The tagline is, whatever makes you happy, just do it, because then you'll be happy. The problem is, from social research, we see that's not true. People aren't just happy doing whatever they want. I was reading one particular guy uh, written an article, and he said, why is it that we're told to be happy, and yet we're so sad? Why is it that we have music on demand, we have movies on demand, we have life coaches, we have self-help books, we have this and that and do whatever you want, and we're still missing something? We're still not really content. Why is that? Because you won't find wholeness and contentment and satisfaction and happiness if you don't have a relationship with the Lord and you don't live and align yourself with Him. He says, if you keep my statutes, if you walk according to my word, you're going to be blessed. You're not gonna, it doesn't mean you're not going to have difficulties, but you will have a greater sense or more satisfaction, more contentment. The psalmist goes on to verse 4 to remind us it's not the commands of God that we're focused on, it's God. He says, you have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. So the one that we're focused on, the one we're worshiping, is not a book. The book is pointing us to a person. And can I encourage you, I'm going to share two things um, that can help us to engage more with Scripture. Uh, because sometimes we're just, it's hard to engage with it. Number one is when you engage with Scripture, think relationally. I know this one has helped me tremendously. It's not like oh, I got to learn this, or I should do this, and rules, and all of that. It's about a relationship with the God who made me, and he wants to talk to me. So every time I open my Bible, it's kind of like this idea of speak, Lord, speak, I'm listening. The one who made me is going to talk to me. So think relationally. He's the one that's laid down the precepts, and he's the one that says, listen, I want you to do this in your relationships. I want you to do this in your marriage. I want you to do this with your parenting. I want you to do this when you grieve. I want you to do this with your money. Here's how I want you to work. He's speaking to you. He's for you, not against you. He wants to bless you. And the psalmist, he gets all of that, but he's like you and me. He still struggles. He's like, I know this is true, but man, I still struggle with living within God's boundaries. Look what he says in verses 5 and 6. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. Oh, that I, I really want to obey you, God. I want to do what you say. I want to live with inside of your word. Notice, he says, when I live according to your word, your decrees, then I would not be put to shame. When I'm considering your commands, I would not be put to shame. What does he mean there? Well, if you look in this psalm, you'll find shame and reproach and disgrace used interchangeably. And he understands this. When we live outside of the boundaries of God's laws, they bring guilt and shame. Whether we're Christians or not Christians, we're all made in the image of God. Romans 2 tells us that God has set his law on our heart. That when we sin, we're not aligned with the one who created us, and so we feel guilt and shame. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, because it leads us, can lead us back to him. So the person that doesn't follow God and wants nothing to do with God or just whatever, they too have a sense of right and wrong, a conscience, because God's law is written on their hearts, and they feel guilt and shame. But what we can do with that is we can push it down. We can do bad things and just push it down and not deal with it. But we'll never be whole. People that go through life, there's people going through life carrying guilt and shame. Looking in the mirror, the world says, tell yourself you love yourself and you're beautiful and you're wonderful. And all the while, I'm lying or I'm cheating or I've done something wrong. And it's still gnawing at me. We can't escape the reality that when we go outside of God's laws, it brings guilt and shame. So he said, I don't want to go outside your laws. I don't want that guilt and shame. So something about Scripture is it steers us on a path that avoids 
things that bring guilt and shame. The Bible is preemptive when it comes to guilt and shame. I grew up in a Christian home, and uh, sex, drugs, rock and roll, 70s, right? Hockey rooms, dressing rooms, all of it. It wasn't in my notes. I'm not going to go there, okay? But just grew up in that environment, and the whole time, I was just like trying to make the decision, is it worth it to follow Jesus, or should I do what everybody else is doing? And I chose as much as I can to be with all my hockey buddies and all the people in high school, uh, but I chose, no, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to do drugs. They tried pretty hard to get me to do them. Uh, but I look back and I'm like, oh my goodness, am I ever grateful. If you have Christian parents, a Christian home, don't take that for granted, gratitude, granted because it, it helps you to avoid guilt and shame. Many people will tell you they've lived outside of God's boundaries and it brought regret and shame. I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I could do that over again. Psalmist is saying, Oh God, I want to stay within your boundaries and obey you. I want to be blessed. Verses 7 and 8, I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. He's resolving to follow God and his word. And then he shares that he understands that when God's word is the top of our mind, it helps us so that we won't go outside of the boundaries, so that we won't sin. In verses 9 through 11, he writes, How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Lord, I want to follow you. I want to get into your word so it's always on my mind so that I don't sin, which brings guilt and shame. I don't want that. And notice he's hiding it in his heart. He's storing it up, little by little, getting more of it into him. And parents, I want to uh, just remind you that with, if you have children, the focus of your, uh, raising your children is not uh, behavior modification where you're focused on what they do and don't do. Like, oh, don't lie because... I don't want people to think I'm a bad parent, you know, don't lie because I might do this or that. Your focus is not on their behavior. Your focus is on their heart. You're saying to them, hey, God who created you, he wants you to tell the truth. He's a truth teller. When you tell the truth and he's a truth teller, you're in line with him. It's going to bring blessing in your life. When you lie, when you steal, when you cheat, when you swear, when you do all of those things, it's outside of his will. It's not a good thing. So it's hearts, and it's our hearts as well. It's getting God's word into our hearts. Jesus, when he was tempted to go outside of the boundaries of God's word, he would say, it is written. It is written. It is written. And when you are in certain, whether it's a work environment, parenting, your marriage, the more that you have it is written going through your mind, the more it can shape you so that you don't sin. Notice there he talks to the young person. Why the young person? And a young man, but young person. Because young people have physiological changes going on in their bodies and they got all these desires, and it's a challenge. To stay within God's word because those desires you're like I just want to go out and fulfill all my desires now just a note those desires are God given but God is for you not against you and he wants you to to manage those desires within his boundaries for example a fire has positive benefits if there's a fire and it's within its boundaries in a pit uh, it can, you can heat your food with it, you can keep warm with it, but fire outside of those boundaries is destructive. Water within its boundaries is a good thing. A river, the water within the banks is good, you can use it to irrigate, irrigate crops, do a whole bunch of things. But water outside of the banks, outside of the boundaries, floods homes, it destroys. The desires God has given to us, they're good within the boundaries, but outside, they bring shame and guilt. So the psalmist is saying, oh God, I want to follow you. I'm struggling, but I want to do your ways. And he knows in verse 45 that if he follows God's way, it will bring freedom. Notice what he says, I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your 
precepts. Now, if I think freedom is doing whatever I want, whenever I want, and all of that uh, narrative, um, yeah, I can do it, but it really doesn't bring me freedom because I end up being enslaved to sin and its consequence. Freedom here for the psalmist is living in a right relationship with God. It's being the person that God has created him to be. Friends, can I tell you, this is your future self. This is you without sin. You are created to be honest and kind and grateful and gentle. You're created to do, to do all those things. And when you follow God's word, it helps you, it aids you to let him work and make you those things. It frees you from selfishness and bitterness and even anxiety and fear, an ongoing battle. The more God's word gets into you, the more you will be blessed. So God's word is preemptive in the sense of, sin, of shame and guilt. It, it keeps us from those things. But here's the good news, everybody, that if you've sinned and there's something that's gnawing at you, God's word is redeemed. Redemptive. Look what he says in verse 39. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. Take away the disgrace or the reproach or the shame. Or the shame. Does everyone know that God is a forgiving, gracious, loving, kind God, and he wants to forgive us? Does anybody celebrate that? Okay. If you're here and you've done something wrong, and you keep asking God to forgive you for it, or you keep tormenting yourself over it, that is not God's will for your life. Here's what you do. With your heart, you go to God, get on your knees, and you confess at once. And you say, Lord, what I did, I agree with you, is sin, it's wrong, and I ask you to forgive me. I believe you died on the cross for all my sins, and I give this sin to you. And you get up off your knees, and you praise him. And then during the day and weeks later, that, that same sin comes up to mind, and you don't confess it again. You say, Lord, thank you that all that sin is covered. Thank you, thank you. So you've confessed it, and it's forgiven, and you don't carry it with you. And that's why God's Word is so important. When you stay in His Word, it takes away the, the disgrace. It, his Word cleanses you. It washes you. It reminds you that that's all been paid for. You're a new creation. <laughs> that you don't have to carry that shame and guilt. You don't have to turn to drugs to try to forget about what you did. You, you give it to God, and you let Him wash over you. John, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Psalm 103, as far as the east, it's from the west. So far has he removed our sins from us. When do the west and east meet? They don't. When are you going to meet your sins? They don't, you won't. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, it is, there is now no condemnation, no judgment for sin for those who are in Christ Jesus. Is there anybody here that just like would stand up and say, you know what? I'm not carrying guilt and shame. I've done something wrong, but I've given it to Jesus and he's cleansed me, he's healed me from it. It's such a wonderful thing. Blessed is the person who lives within and is talking to God and letting God talk to him through the word or letting God talk to her through the word because we're, we're coming whole, the people we've been created to be. Second reason for you to open God's word, it protects you, it shields you. Verses 22 and 23 speak to this. The psalmist says, remove from me their scorn and contempt, for I keep your statutes. The rulers sit together and slander me, your servant will meditate on your decrees. That slander has the idea they speak against me. And the context here, if you look a couple of verses earlier, or a verse or two earlier, it's people that don't know God and are arrogant and don't want anything to do with God and see that person there that's following God, they kind of turn their attention and, and they're slandering, maybe lying about the psalmist, spreading false things about the psalmist, belittling the psalmist, scorn, contempt, slander. And he says, remove it from me as I meditate on your word. In other words, when I get God's word into me, hurtful words from people don't have the same effect on me. His word 
is like a shield of faith. It blocks those hurtful words from getting into your heart. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Words can kill you, destroy you. And when people say something about you at work or wherever it is because you're a Christian or someone doesn't like you, you're a goody two-shoes or whatever it is, they can say hurtful words. They can say words about your body shape. They can say words about all things. And they can be hurtful if you let them get into your heart. But you need to learn to shield your heart and block them. And how do you do that? You meditate on God's word. In other words, you let God define who you are. You let God tell you who you are. Uh, and by the way, all of us can meditate. If you can worry, you can meditate, right? Okay. Meditation is rumination. It's a cow chewing its cud, right? Burping, back up, chewing again and again, over and over, right? That's what you should be doing with God's word. You burp it up, there it is again, okay? Burp it up. That's meditating on God's Word. Instead of rehearsing, oh, so-and-so said this, and you're going to this friend and that friend, oh, so-and-so, this, you know, they said this about me, and please affirm me and all. No, you're rehearsing what God says about you. It shields you. Have you learned to deflect hurtful things with God's Word? He goes on to say in verse 24, your statutes are my delight, they are my counselors. Oh, I'm not in a good place in God's Word. And there's a place for counselors in person. I guess online too, but in person. Christian counselors that are good. But your Word is counselor. What do I do here? What do I say here? Lord, thank you. Thirdly, God's Word strengthens you. Blesses you, it's, it uh, shields you or protects you, and then it strengthens you. Verses 25 and 28 speak to this. I am laid low in the dust. Preserve my life according to your word. My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Lord, give me strength. Preserve my life. And what's that connected to? Your word, God. The psalmist here, notice he's laid low in the dust. He's basically, he's on the dirt. He's on the ground, face down. He's hit rock bottom, something in his life. And that's where he finds himself. And I think for most of us, you're here, you've probably been on the ground a time or two. Maybe with, it's with a child at school and it's just struggling and you're just like, you don't know what to do. Maybe it's uh, with your health or someone's health that you love and you just you want to control the situation and you just can't. You don't know what to do. Or maybe it's to do with your job and stresses at your job uh, or finances. Maybe it's to do with a relationship and a broken relationship and you find yourself on the dirt like the psalmist and you're crushed. And your tears, he says, my soul is weary with sorrow. You, you're, you're weighted down and... and, and and you're, in a sense, you've lost kind of like any strength to go on. You've lost hope. That's him. And what does he do? He turns to God's word. Strengthen me according to your word. Have you learned to get strength in the Lord? Have you learned to encourage yourself in his word when you're down? You'll find in the Psalms, the psalmist time and time again, and if you're going through trials, it's a great book to go to, but the psalmist is on the ground and doesn't want to go on. Oh, and then you find the psalmist as they're bringing God to mind in his word, he's on his knees. Oh, and then you find the psalmist on his feet and he's going through another day. And sometimes God just gives you enough strength for the day. It's like day by day by day. Lord, three things I pray. Okay, help me to get on my feet. Help me to go. God's grace. His strength is a daily thing. Maybe you need to go on your knees and say, Lord, I need strength. Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. Lord, I'm not God. You are your sovereign God. You're in control of my life. Psalm 121, 
I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Psalm 139. Lord, you know when I sit and when I stand. You know all of my ways. The more that you get God's word and his truth in you, the Holy Spirit can take that as you go through the day and strengthen you. And maybe you need to this week, just go get a Bible, go to a solitary place, quiet you and God, and just sit and pour out your heart to God and then open his word to a psalm and believe him. God's word blesses, it protects, and it strengthens. Okay, now let's look at some ways to engage with scripture. And for the next three weeks, we'll be talking about these uh, different ways. Uh, The first way, obviously, is to read it. Okay, every time I open the Bible, this is the God who made me talking to me, and I need to read it. So two things about uh, helping us better engage with God's word. First is I need to think relationship. Okay, this is about me and my relationship with God. But secondly, I need to think routine. If you're here and you're thinking, I'm going to start reading the Bible, but you're going to do it without a routine, uh, probably not going to last a whole long time. Uh, As someone has said, habits eat willpower for breakfast. You can have willpower, but in time, uh, it's not that strong. There's something stronger. It's a habit. It's a routine. Uh, Seth Godin, who's a marketing guy, um, an author, he's got a book written on habits, and and he talks about if you want to develop a habit, use the shower technique, okay? So if you want to develop the habit of reading the Bible, develop the the shower technique. And he says this in his book, the way to get in shape, if you want to get your body in shape, is not to go and try some fancy diet. If you want to get in shape, here's what you do. You go to the gym, you change your clothes, and you take a shower. And the next day, go to the gym, change your clothes, and take a shower. And he says, if you can do that for 30 days, pretty soon you'll find yourself doing something while you're at the gym. He says, taking a shower and losing weight have nothing to do with each other. But his point is, is if you can get to the gym consistently, working out is secondary. The hard part is showing up. And the same is true with reading God's Word. If you can take, go, to, go somewhere, go to a room, go to chair at work or at home, and go and sit it in five minutes tomorrow, and then five minutes the next day, or maybe you want to take ten, and just go sit in the chair. Sit in the chair. Eventually you're going to say, huh, what should I be doing in this chair? And you've got that Bible handy. Oh, I'll open the Bible. Okay. That's how you develop a routine. And again, this series is not about saying, hey, you need to be in the Bible more because I struggle with getting into the Bible. I've struggled my whole life. I have different seasons. Okay. But I know there's a discipline to it. And I want to encourage you. Maybe it's five days a week. I'm going to try for this. Maybe it's even one or two days a week. I'm going to start on this day and this day. Here's my routine, and I'm going to work, and I'm going to go sit there, and I've got a Bible handy. And the reason you want to get the Bible into you is because you're in a relationship with God, and you want Him to do things in your life. So read it is one way to engage. Another way is pray it, right? As you get God's Word into you, you can pray it uh, in the day. Um, This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. How many of you learned that as a kid in your family? You know, you'd just be going to school, the worst day ever, and then your mom would say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Yeah. But man, that sticks with you, and you begin to pray it. And you've got a great day. You're going to Canada's Wonderland. Oh, Lord, this is a day. Thank you for this day. Or you're going through a really miserable day, and you're like, Lord, help me to make it through this day. This is the day the Lord has made. Or trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean on in your understanding. You turn it into prayer. Lord, I'm... I'm not sure what's going to happen as I make this visit or I go here, but I'm going to trust you with all my heart. You pray it. Third way is sing it, um, getting God's truth into you, uh, engaging with it through song, right? I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Anybody sang that song a few hundred times? I am, right? I'm not a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. This uh, week at our weekly staff meeting before we at our staff meeting, uh, or part, as we began our staff meeting, we sang a song. It was called, Who You Say I Am. Listen to the, to the chorus. I am a child of God. 
I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me and not against me. I am who you say I am. Anybody got hurtful words coming their way? Okay. You need to get these life-giving words and sing them into your soul. Number four is memorize it, committing it to memory. The Holy Spirit has a way. If you memorize Scripture, He'll bring it up. You're having a disagreement with your spouse? Sometimes He'll bring that up. Struggle with your parent? He'll bring that up. But you've got to commit to memorizing it. Number five, listen to it. You can listen to God's Word audibly um, as you are working in the home, as you are driving in the car. Uh, six is share it um, with another Christian. Hey, oh, God said this. Maybe with a non-Christian, John 3, 16, or you're sharing his word. Seven, you can journal it. Anybody here like journaling? I've never quite understood those who journal, but okay. <laughs> Maybe that works for you. And then number uh, eight is you can study it, right? Which often involves a pen. I love God's word with a pen, just uh, studying underlining verbs and moving this over here, uh, precept Bible studies, um, Bible recap Bible studies. There's lots of Bible studies out there. That's studying God's Word. God is for you, not against you, and He offers you, hey, I want to talk to you. I want to work in your life. And so would you make this your prayer? I'm going to ask you as the worship team comes forward to bow your heads. And would you, here's what the psalmist says in the psalm. He says, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Would you make that your prayer this morning? Lord, going forward, I do want you to open my eyes to wonderful things. And maybe there's something you're struggling with. Lord, would you open my eyes to what you want to say to me through your word?